Hello again, everybody. Marty Braden here. Welcome to my channel. If this is your first time watching one of my videos, if you feel it was worth your valuable time after we're all done, please take a moment to click on the subscribe, like, and notification buttons. It'll really help my channel grow. The algorithm makes my videos reach a much larger audience when you do that, so I really appreciate it. Now, for those of you who may be getting a little weary of me saying this each time I start my videos, please understand, please understand that I've been getting an average of almost 200 new subscribers a day now. So I feel a strong desire to express my thanks to those of you who are just joining in for checking out my channel. Okay, in the way of introduction and, and introducing my topic today, which is the remnant of Jacob will soon be upon us, I want to introduce you to a lovely, lovely young woman who's a special guest today that I have with me on my podcast today. Her name is Andrea Hales, and she's the host of a podcast called Tribe of Testimonies. Welcome to my channel, Andrea. Yeah, it's A. Good to have you here. Now, you have, you're a mother of how many children? I have four children. And you somehow managed to send them to go play. Well, <laughs> I've now. been doing that. I've been doing that for the past three and a half years. So I'm like, there are times when I, I just need you to get out of here. So. <laughs> Good. We're so happy to have you. For those of you who are watching right now, let me set the table for why I'm doing this video with Andrea today. One of my subscribers sent me an email and suggested that I invite Andrea to be a special guest on my YouTube channel. And so I looked her website up. And I listened to some of her guest podcast interviews that she's done that you can find on her website. And they were quite positive and quite fascinating to me. And in speaking to Andrea, I found out that she is a genuine, authentic Navajo Indian who also happens to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also discovered that her own story was like most indigenous Native American stories, all of whom are part of the remnants of Jacob that we're talking about today. Now, Andrea... Is it okay if I bring up on my screen your website so that viewers can see what you've done and what you're working on? And that way, they'll have a sense of what your podcast is all about. Sure. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to share some things here. Let me see. If... Okay. There we are. So this is what I was showing the folks. And I apologize to you watching. But anyhow, I'm 70 years, years old this coming Saturday. It's in two days. <laughs> so I, I use that excuse when I do technical fupas. So anyhow. Here's a lot. I'm going to move this one thing out of my way, too. Uh, I don't need that there. So you can see these interviews that uh, you've done, Andrea, July 23rd, just a couple of days ago. And each one, I'm, I'm not going to be bold enough to read Lakota and Essanaboane. I don't know how to pronounce that. Essanaboane. And then Navajo Pueblo, Yaqui. I mean, it's just every one of these are Native American Indians ancestry. And it's interviews. And like I said, there's 180 plus that you've done and the ones I listened to were quite fascinating to me I enjoyed it very much so that's partially why you're I'm having this um, zoom call with you and so do you want to share a little bit about the tribe of testimonies sure um yeah so I've been doing it since for over three and a half years now I have um 100 and well the Danae Elton was 179 numbered 179 uh, a couple of them I've done with two people at the same time, but not very many. Um, I have almost 100 tribes represented, but there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the United States of America and approximately the same number in Canada. Plus, there are state recognized tribes, and there are some tribes that are not recognized at all anymore. So. Now, I know you focus on the United States and Canada, not the South America, and that's okay. This is still right. exciting, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I I interview them, and we talk about how the gospel of Jesus Christ relates to um, their heritage. And some people were raised traditionally, and some people were not, and some people were raised um, with kind of both. I was not raised traditionally, so I actually learn a lot from those that have been raised traditionally, and I love that. Um, yeah, I, I've been doing it. I try to put out one a week, and it's so great. And that's a chore, and I, I respect you for that. I know what you're doing. That's great. Now, Andrea, my viewers know that I have had two Zoom calls with Chief David Medigal recently, and I had a discussion with the host of Zion Media, Shane Baldwin, where we discussed Chief Medigal's arrival on the scene in recent months and the message he's been sharing with the world. 
In particular, we discussed his frustration with some Latter-day Saints and the negative feedback he's gotten. Because of the relationship I had started with Chief Medega, I wanted to express why I felt we should all withhold judgment about Chief Medega until we gain further light knowledge, like I said, and just see how his mission and message unfolds going forward. Now, that said, I want those of you who are watching this video to know that Andrea has not met Chief David Medega personally, and due to her responsibilities that she just went over, and the work she's doing with her podcast, Tribe of testimony. She hasn't focused on Chief Medigo or taken the time to learn more about him right now, and that's just fine. That could change in time, of course, but that's okay. Right now, uh, we're, she's heavily involved in these interviews and multiple guests on her channel, all being Latter-day Saint Indigenous American Indians. And I say this, I, I have seen that pretty much every one of them have some pretty fantastic stories as it relates to what we're talking about today. Do I have that right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, now, that's exciting, Andrew. I'm happy for you and what you've thrown yourself into. It takes courage and it takes some time and study and, and confidence. And that is just exciting for me. I've enjoyed what I've heard so far, like I said. So can you give us a little more insight to your own personal family's background and maybe go far as back as you want to go on both sides or not? I'll just leave that up to you. Sure. So um, I did say yacht A at the beginning, but Yat A she Andrea Hales Yenisha Goke initially Bill Gana Bashish Chin uh Fair New Tha De Nasha. Um I don't speak Navajo. I probably slaughtered all of that uh once somebody told me they could kind of understand me. So it sounded I, lovely. I, I just like Andrea Hales. That was so <laughs> I am not I'm not a Navajo speaker, but um so um, my mom is Navajo and my dad is white. Biligana means the white man. And so uh, my mom's, so it, it, the Navajo nation is a matriarchal lineage. And so we we take our clans from our, our parents. So I take my mom's first clan as my first clan. I take my dad's first clan as my second clan. I take my mom's th third or second clan as my third clan and my dad's second clan as my fourth clan so and we always goes back all the way yeah. like if i if i had done it the full thing i would introduce myself with all four clans but i don't have that memorized i can kind of read it when i have it out in front of me i need to memorize it i don't have it so my mom's first clan is quilket and it's uh the hairy ones or the weaver people um and then my mom's second clan. So my third clan is Sinatjini, which is the Black Street Wood people. Like I said, Biligana is my dad. So his first and second clans are Biligana. So I would go Bill, I would go uh the Harry Weaver clan, white man, the Black Street Wood people, white man. Wow. So wow. that's that's, that's how I would introduce myself. Um, I grew up in Farron, Utah, where my dad grew up, where his dad grew up. Um so my dad is from Pioneer Stock, and um, my mom actually has a wee tiny bit of Pioneer Stock in her line as well. Um, but my mom was not raised traditionally. I have pieced things together as far as that to try to figure it out. Where was um, she raised? Where was your mother raised? Right. My mom was raised on the reservation, on the Navajo reservation in Navajo, New Mexico. Okay. And my my grandfather is half Navajo. So like if you want to get real technical, I'm three eighths Navajo. So um I'm like thirty-eight percent, thirty-five percent, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm like if you get really technical, I'm three eighths Navajo, <laughs> but it's I mean it's easier to say my mom is Navajo, which she is, and so um my mom was raised until the um, missionaries came and offered the Indian placement program through the church to her. And she Can you explain that. I'm sure there's not members of the church that watch this. Explain about what time that started. And it was at the time your mother, uh, I'm interested in that. I think it started in the late forties. I don't have the, I'm not a researcher. I don't No, That's I, fine. Yeah. I don't have it memorized. The 1940s right on there. And the, the the late was 40s. quite involved in that. Yeah. So, so it started in the late forties, like as a real big program. So my mom, when she was a little kid, it was going full, full force at the time. And uh, the Indian placement program, as I understand it, was to give 
opportunities to children on reservations to give them an opportunity to get a better education and to see how living the gospel of Jesus Christ looks in a family. So um, I've, I've interviewed actually quite a few people who are either placement children or children of placement children. I am a child of, of a placement uh, participant. My mom was on a placement program. So she went it, went on the program when she was, I think she was like nine. So she was baptized and then she went on the program. And I grew up with a grandma who was my foster grandma and my mom called her mom. And so I had three sets of grandparents. Well, I didn't know that foster father, but he yeah. died before I came along. But I, I have three three par grandparents that I consider my parents or grandparents. So did yeah. your mother talk much about her experience as nine and leaving her, her home and going into a placement situation? Has she ever talked much to you about it or do you interview about it or curious? um her story is is kind of traumatic. So okay. I don't I don't uh let her I don't I haven't had an interview with her because okay. it's painful. Yeah it's painful. So the placement program for her was actually so good. Like she was so blessed and happy to be on a placement program. And uh, that's where she met my dad. And how, um, so how long was she in that, in that home and placed in, did she, I'm sure she visited back and forth to reservation, yeah. but how old was she when she stopped that or, or did she ever? Um, so the placement program was until you graduated from high school. Okay. If, if you chose. It was nobody was forced to go on it. There are people that say that you were forced to go on it. it. Unlike boarding schools, the government boarding schools, the placement program was voluntary. Um, and people will argue with me about that, but a, the placement program was voluntary. The child had to be baptized and they chose to go on it. And the parents chose for the, that one of the parents at least had to agree that their child could go on the placement program. So it wasn't like the, the, uh, the government even swooping them away. Under yeah, it wasn't, it, that wasn't the situation. And there were like, views, different views out there. And we grant people their views because quite frankly, each one of our lives are individual. You have your own individual view and experience as did your mother, your grandmother, and those that maybe speak negatively, they could very well have had a bad experience and then caps and said, everything's that bad way. So I hear what you're saying. And I appreciate you saying that it's, it's both that, you know, of both sides. That's great. Well, the, yeah. Like, and there were, there were people that did not have a good experience on the placement program. I, I mean, one of my mom's families, my mom actually lived with multiple families, but I, I only consider one of the parent sets as a grandparent set. She didn't have a great relationship with all of her families. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think but that's it, that's a tough thing. I mean, I don't know what I've done at nine years old, being excited, but then maybe I didn't connect with. It's just a unique experiment, and where I view it. And, and, yeah. and it sounds like she did get some good education, though, and some positive experiences, and yeah. and was had someone to teach the gospel if she was baptized before. And did that set and take root with her? What's how'd that go during her yes eighteen or whatever. So my mom has remained an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout her life because she, because of the placement program, because of good parents that she was placed with. Um, and, and I'm so grateful for that because I, I love my life. I, I love who I am. I love, I love both heritage. I, I, I am so grateful for who I am. I'm grateful for my pioneer ancestors and I'm grateful for my Native American ancestors. In fact, my son just barely came back from a uh, trek for our stake did trek for the youth. And we were asked to write our children a letter. And I realized I don't talk to him enough about um, the fact that the Navajo people went on a terrible, they were forced to go on this walk. So the ones that came back, we, you can say that we are, we are children of survivors. Are and you I about the Trail of Tears. No, that's Cherokee. Cherokee, the, okay. The Tell long walk. The long walk is the one that the Navajo were forced on. Oh, they okay. were, they were taken out of their ancestral lands and forced to go to a, 
um, army fort mm -hmm. and then they they were released and it was miserable like people so many people died both going to being there and coming back yeah, because back. yeah because of the cruelty of the u.s government so i wrote that in my son's letter for pioneer trek i'm like i told him all these good things and then i said remember you are the the progeny of survivors mm -hmm. I'm so proud of the pioneers for, and this is something hard for a lot of people that are Native Americans because they they hate manifest destiny and what it did. And I I understand it it was not a a wonderful thing, but I can't change the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm a very like I'm a very different person than very many na natives that you're gonna find. I am grateful for the the settlements that came, and especially grateful for the settlers that were able to work with the natives instead of instead of treating them as less than human. I'm so Those grateful. Savages, for often were said. Yeah. yeah. Now tell us a little bit, if you don't mind. You mentioned briefly, and then you went on with your grandma or grandmother. Uh, being in place, uh, not a placement, but in boarding. Uh, I want. I don't quite understand that. I haven't had a chance to really dig in, but I'm sure you know what that is and could explain that to us a little bit because that's a totally different background than her daughter had. In, yeah. In placement. So, as so, I I'm only placing. I'm only making speculations because my okay. grandma doesn't speak about her past. Interesting. Yeah. Like, in fact, my grandmother doesn't hasn't even told my mom like as much family history as she possibly could my grandmother is still alive and so Wonderful. it's it's kind of this black hole of mystery <laughs> well you, you have an opportunity the talent you have to and the love to try to catch that on and get that recorded and say yeah marvelous but yeah I, I she has a story it. to tell if she would yeah, I don't see her very often because I live in Utah in Salt Lake Valley and she lives on the reservation. So I I need to make time to go down and yeah, but um so as I, the only thing that I can figure out is my grandma was a boarding school child and that was that stripped her of her native identity as far as like traditional ways because my mom was not raised traditionally as I said. And, and she my, didn't have a chance to be, sounds like. Yeah, and my grandfather, I think because his father was white, they were not raised traditionally. So both of my grandparents didn't raise my my mom traditionally. That, I mean, that like, tradition didn't, tr not trickle, but transfer down to your mother and transfer down to you. So it kind of got diluted with European where it weighs in the church and that kind of thing and and it kind of faded away in some regard which is yeah. it's, it's, correct me if i'm wrong it's sad really because it's yeah. rich and it's just yeah. rich uh traditions and thoughts and teaching i just find it so fascinating yeah and that's one of the things that i love about my podcast is because like i said earlier i learn about my own heritage through my podcast but i feel like i was placed on the earth at this time and given this mission because I'm supposed to be this kind of a bridge, this mm -hmm. kind of a, a connector. And um, so, yeah, I didn't really, really pursue uh, learning about my Navajo side until I went to BYU. So after I graduated from high school and I, I yeah, that's, that's marvelous. Well, yeah. Andrew, after interviewing so many of your guests uh, for your Tribe of Testimonies podcast, all of whom, as I understand it, are faithful Native American Latter-day Saints and are from tribes living all across the United States and Canada, do they understand that they are truly part, do most of them understand they're truly part of the branch of Jacob and are part of the fulfillment of the Lord's prophecies regarding the Lord's promises to them and their, their progenitors? Yeah, I think they do. In fact, that's one of the questions that I ask them. I I have four different parts to my podcast on a traditional, like, unless they derail it right off the bat. I ask them to introduce themselves in their tribal way as much as possible. If it's in their language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language and some languages are dead. 
And then I ask them to share something they love about their heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's super fun to talk about all those things. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and then the, yeah, the third part, we just talk about life and living and different things. So whatever we want to talk about. But the fourth question pertains exactly to what you're talking about. I asked them, what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? And I've only had one person who says that they don't believe that they're actually um, the the lineage, the genetic lineage of, of Israel. Only one person has, has said against that. So for the most part, those members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we believe that we are the remnant of Jacob. We're, we are Lehi's sons and daughters. Well, I, that's wonderful. I, I understand it uh, then, Andrew. Your objective with this podcast has been to help your listeners learn how the gospel of Jesus Christ has influenced yours and your guests' lives as Native American Indians. And of course, each of your guests' stories are different. Their conversions, their families, missions, education, careers, talents, achievements, failures, and trials, all of these experiences have made for a very interesting story for each one of them. And the ones that I've listened to certainly fits that mold, especially as it encompasses their experience as members of the church, as they've come to know the restored gospel more fully, and God's restoring the branch of Jacob to the tree, bringing them back to that wonderful tree that's, that's talked about in the book of Jacob here in the last day. So can I take a moment, and I apologize to the audience because it's going to seem like I'm just dominant here, but I want to take a moment to read a few scriptures and make a few comments that the prophets have made regarding the remnant of Jacob. I'm going to take a little moment to do that if, if I can. Is that all right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Just if you have to do something on there, that's fine, <laughs> but it's going to be just a few minutes. But let me just read these to you. Okay. In the proclamation by the 12 apostles given back in 1845, we are told, speaking of the Lamanites of North and South America, they will also come to the knowledge of their forefathers and the fullness of the gospel, and they will embrace it and become a righteous branch of the house of Israel. That's in the proclamation of the prophet office, April 6, 1845, page 3. President Brigham Young said, speaking of the conversions of the Lamanites, said, look to see them like a flame of fire, a mighty rushing torrent, like the Grand March of Angels. And that was Young's Women's Journal, May 1890, page 263. President John Taylor expressed this thought. The same organization of priesthood must be introduced and maintained among those of Lehi as amongst those of Israel, gathered from among the Gentile nations. A letter to A. Carrington Liverpool in 1888. President Wilford Woodruff penetrated the future and revealed this. Zion is bound to rise and flourish. The Lamanites will blossom as the rose on the mountains. Every word that God has ever said of them will have its fulfillment. And they, by and by, will receive the gospel. It will be a day of God's power among them. And I love this little that end of that sentence. And a nation will be born in a day. <laughs> That's something. Uh, the Journal of Discourses, 15 pages 282. Now may we consider the book of Revelations of today as shared by President Spencer W. Kimball, where he said, and I quote, the Lamanites must rise in majesty and power. And that was 1947. This prophetic statement was made October of 3rd of 1947 when in Central America, and that's a little bit not part where you cover much, but I still want to say it. When in Central America, there were fewer than 100 members. And in that great land of Mexico, there were fewer than 5,000, half of whom were in the Mormon colonies. The fewer the excuse me, the fewer than 100 in Central America, when these prophetic words were uttered, has blossomed into more than 40,000 as of today. And that was uh, 1947. Can imagine what's happened since then, 70 years. From the fewer than 5,000 in Mexico at that time, a rich harvest of over 150,000 stand tall in the field, white already to harvest. The total membership of 1947 represents a harvest of a pair of months today. To continue the statement of President Kimball, we must look forward to the day, okay, looking forward to the day, this is about 1950, when they shall have economic security. Now, you mentioned the placement program, hoping to do some of these things. They said, have economic security, culture, refinement, and education, when they shall be operating farms and businesses and industries, and shall be occupied in the professions and in the teaching. 
When these words reached our ears in 1947, it wouldn't have required two fingers of one hand to number the professional people in the church in Mexico and Central America, or the number of cars on the, or the number of homes with modern conveniences. They shall be operating farms, President Kibble said. One state present manages a complex of seven farms with over 400,000 chickens. That's a very successful name line, he's obviously saying. President Kimball continues, businesses and industries and um, occupied in the professions and in teaching. Listen to this list describing state presidencies, high counselors and bishops in Mexico City. Area quote, architects, attorneys, engineers, ergonomic, biochemical, mechanical, and aeronautical, petroleum, topographical, civil electrical, engineers, doctors of medicine, including surgeons and pediatricians, dentists, nurses, business managers, tailors, carpenters, building contractors, teachers, school administrators, auto mechanics, business machine repairmen, blacksmiths, insurance agents, farmers, some very humble, and the list goes on and on. To match this list is the rising of a nation. The birthplace of one of the largest refineries in Latin America rests within view of an ancient Toltec statuary waiting to process encased rivers of oil prepared for hundreds of miles over mountains and across valleys. An electric generating complex sufficient to produce comfort for many cities is pushed into the sky beside the remains of ancient civilizations that reached a peak of peace toward which we are striving. President Kimball continues, when they shall be organized into wards and stakes of Zion, he said, 15 stakes organized in one day, many more in the wings awaiting polish and reproval. I won't go any further. There's more here. That an article called, And the Lamanite Shall Blossom of the Rose, was given in 1963 by Marin G. Romney. Wonderful, wonderful comments on that. But I just let folks look that up because it's quite the thing. Uh, and he said, concerning the timetable for the fulfillment of these tremendous prophecies, Jesus said, I give unto you a sign that you may know that the time when these things shall be about to take place, when these things which I declare unto you shall be made known unto the Gentiles and shall come forth of the Father from them unto your seed, and thy seed shall begin to know these things. It shall be a sign unto them that they may know that the work of the Father hath already commenced unto the fulfilling of the covenant which he hath made unto the people who are of the house of Israel. Third Nephi 21 verses 1 through 3 and 5 and 7. That started 194 years ago when the Book of Mormon was translating the church started. That was 194 years ago. Now, with this foreknowledge as an interpretive guide to the signs of the times, all who have seen eyes and understanding hearts may rest assured that the fulfillment of the promise to the Lamanites is at hand. Andrea, I appreciate your patience. Any thoughts that I've shared, what I've said so far, any thoughts that have come to your heart as I've mentioned those? Uh, I I think it is coming to pass. I think, well, I think there are a lot of signs of the times that are coming to pass. And I think definitely the Lamanites blossoming, blossoming as a rose is coming to pass. There's so many smart people and there are so many people that are taking responsibility for their own tribes. And there's so many people that are recognizing the truth and coming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I there are so many people that are falling away as well, but I think, I think that they see the goodness of the gospel and are, are coming back to it. And I just, even if they're not members of the church, I feel like there's so many people that are um, just flourishing. So I, yeah, I think, I think it's true. Well, you mentioned your parents are Navajo and that your mother participated in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the emplacement program in the sixties. Uh, I wanted to jump one ahead and uh, say something. It says, what, if anything, did, Andrew, did your forebears tell you or teach you about uh, this ancestry, tradition, culture, and teachings that helped you see and understand the gospel? It was eight. You, were, you certainly weren't an apologist back then <laughs> as a little eight-year-old about the gospel. And you've gained knowledge since then. But as you've gained knowledge and know the answer and what you've been learning through your podcast, how does that impacted you? knowing that these promises were made to you personally and that this land is your inheritance and the gospel is your inheritance. What's that been like to be knowing that you're part of the branch of Jacob? I I uh, read a book called He Walked the Americas when I was a kid and I was like, this is so cool. This is me. And uh, there are so many records, um, mostly oral of of Jesus Christ coming and teaching the people 
And as I've done the interviews, there are so many people that are like, oh yeah, the ceremonies that we do are so the same as the temple or so similar to the temple. You're talking about in the lodge and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and each, each tribe, each tribe has its own ceremonies and, and yes. traditions. So there's not one blanket statement that everybody does the same thing. I, uh, there's Understood. over 500, you could call them religions. So. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you would think over time, certainly 2000 years, <laughs> <laughs> things can change. I mean, the, the yeah. Chinese whispering game, you know what that is, where you have about 30 people in a circle and you start with a planned written statement and you read it once and they don't read it right. And it goes on and goes on whispering all the way around and come back to finally the 30th person. What it says is so <laughs> demonstrably different than what was originally stated. It's just the human nature and our ability to remember properly and, and all that kind of thing. And then maybe there's some even personal intent to change it. I mean, it's just an interesting thing what nearly two millennia can do to one's story and one's faith. Right. But in right. the stories that you've listened to and that you've had the, the gift of having with these uh, Native American folks, has anything stood out, any fun stories that we ought to go tell? Oh, this is a, I'm sure they're all great, but is there anything that stands out or you've done that really struck you and said, man, I'm so glad I did that one. Anything st comes to mind? I should have prepared uh you. Do, do you mean like are any of that do you want me to tell you some specific any the interviews absolutely that you thought were fantastic fun and i'm sure they all were but i'm saying something that stuck out to you i'll, I'll give you a couple examples um so if we're talking about traditions native traditions uh my friend curtis leclerc he talks about a gathering powwow that they have once a year and it's what's his background what's his uh, is, is he navajo or is he you're not sure no, he's a Dakota, I think, okay. but I can't remember what his tribe, like, I can't say his tribe's name, <laughs> okay. but he, they, so he's from the Great Lakes area. His, his family is originally from there and um, they have this powwow, a gathering powwow every year. And the way he described it, I could just see it in heaven. I could just see this powwow looking like when we get back to heaven how there's going to be this gathering and we're just going to have a grand so council again yeah we're going to be so happy to see each other and we're going to report back and we're going to give anything that we can give to to show that we love each other i just loved his description of that so much i could visualize this heaven what was the name I again so we want to go look at it what's the name on it Curtis Leclerc. He was my first year, so he was in 21. Okay, Curtis Leclerc. Wonderful. Uh, um, another one that I really loved was, um, <laughs> there's so many interesting ones. Um, let's see. I really loved Milo Fowler. He actually is a National Geographic um, photographer. And he wasn't raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was converted when he was in high school. Mm. His conversion story, it it does it's not like a so it doesn't focus on the traditional part so much, but his conversion story and the way that he shares it, like it's one of my favorite episodes from last year, from 2023. I, one more time, his name is again. His name is Milo Fowler. Milo Fowler, everybody. Okay. And, yeah. uh, now I noticed too, too, as I went through that 180 videos uh, or uh, dialogues, I know this, um, Elder uh, Larry Echohark, you, you had a, it, how'd that go? What was that like? I'm going, I haven't had a chance. I just noticed I'm going to go down and watch it later today. But Well, I went to law school. I went to law school and he was one of my law school professors. So I, I kind of had a little bit of a relationship with him already before that. Um, but he invited us into his home and he shared about his his conversion and about how he's had to stick up for the church in different various aspects of his personal life, like in the military and um, in, I don't know, just different places that the uh, Obama administration asked him to go back to Washington, D.C. to be a um uh 
head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And wow. so, yeah, so he he just shared all this cool stuff. But he, I mean, you can find most of those stories that he shared in other talks. The best part, though, was when he took us out in his house after we finished recording and he showed us all these cool things about his family and about different things he he's learned. And I was like, I wish we could have recorded all of this because he, it was even more personal. So he just, he just loves his heritage so much and he sees how it combines with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think he, I think that's one of his missions in life was to do that, to share, to share that, how they overlap, how they combine, Enhance how they each other, make each other stronger. Well, I, as we wind down, I think, uh, Andrea, what I'd like to do is ask you one last question. And that is, you know, there's a lot of talk about the um, um, remnant of Israel, the remnant of Jacob, bringing all the tribes and it's going to come to the land of Missouri, Independence, Missouri, and it's going to build up the new Jerusalem and they're going to help with that. But that also talks about them bringing their records and their scriptures because they've had prophets through the two millennia, wherever it was, the Savior went and visited. It's pretty amazing. He said, other sheep I have. And he even told the people, the Nephites in America, I have other sheep. And so how do you, you're just one lovely woman in the church that is a, has rich heritage and part of this remnant? How do you see or feel or have a sense of how that's going to take place when that is it just going to all of a sudden in one day a nation comes and bring their records or is it going to be a little spotted here and a little piece bill there, here a little, there a little? I'm just curious what's your own view of that. And if you haven't spent a long time thinking about that, that's okay too. I'm just curious from your point of view, your perspective. I, I have thought about that and I don't know how it's going to happen. I, I can speculate like I think that there's going to be a day and I think it will be as more signs come but I feel like and I am not a prophet I am not claiming to be a prophet this is Neither just, one of us are we're not we're not representing the church but this is just your feelings go ahead yeah just I just have had the the idea come that I feel like one day there's going to become there's going to be a time when the people are going to, the Native Americans are going to have to witness that, yeah, what the church has claimed about the Book of Mormon and Jesus coming happened to their people. Like people who were members of the church, people who are members of the church, people who've never been members of the church, who, people who don't claim to be Christians at all. But Native Americans are going to have to one day be like, yeah, that, that, those stories are with the stories that I've been told all my life by, by my um, grandparents and my great grandparents, and they've been passed down. I feel like that one day it's going to have to happen like that. It's going to be a gathering too, many tribes gathering type thing and coming together that way and bringing. Yeah, your... and, I, and I think that that kind of already does happen because of the political and legal stuff that that goes on in the United States. I feel like that part of the gathering happens a lot more often, but I feel like, I feel this like that. special. Yeah. 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 Well, you're delightful. You're lovely. And I'm happy that uh, you made some carved out some time for me and I appreciate it so much, sister Hales. It's a, it's a, uh, it, to me, it's a sacred thing. Your, your story and the, your guests stories and you all live amongst this and we live amongst you, but uh, some of us, I can speak for myself, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I've been lax in really um, learning and looking into that. And I, in high school, I sort of paid attention to history, but we didn't talk a lot about the um, Native American history and how the government treated them. And I mean, it's just what I hear today, in my mind, I just say, where have I been? So I, I want to apologize to you and your, your folks. It's just a I want to be more aware and I want to be more appreciative. And so thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I wish you every bit of success, continued success in what you're doing. Sounds like you're loving it. I do. I love it. I've made so many good friends because of it. Any last comment you want to share before I close this off? Um, I'll just say what it means to me to belong to the tribe of Israel, if that's okay. You bet. It means 
that Heavenly Father is aware of me. Um, it means that I have a purpose and a, a responsibility to help bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those around me and uh, to my brothers and sisters who are of the, who are children of, of Lehi. It means that the Book of Mormon is for me specially. And I love the Book of Mormon. I, uh, I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon and I have a testimony of Jesus Christ, our savior. I know that I am a child of God. I know that I am a child of the covenant and I know that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I say that name of, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Now, for those of you who are watching this, just know this. This is why I included this in my Dispelling the Accusatory Fog series of videos that is to reaffirm the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, reaffirm the truthfulness of the Savior Jesus Christ and his love for all of God's children. And Andrea is one, a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. You're all children of God. Anyhow, until next time, I want to wish you all continued success. Goodbye.